Welcome back, everyone. Glad you joined us again for a basic conversation. Uh, In this podcast episode, Father Basic and I will delve into a a recent lecture of his that focused on caring for the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health. And JB, it's great to be alongside you again. There's a lot of material, Brad. We better hurry (laughs) up to get all that in. And this topic of health is, and especially the kind of the pillars I just mentioned, um, is a, is a relevant conversation anytime, but coming out of COVID yeah. and the impact of on all of us at various degrees, this conversation is even more relevant. And I think that's why you brought it forward. Yes, for sure. And right at the beginning, Brad, in case you don't ask me, I have to talk about the word health, the word health. So we often think of health as something we have. We're either healthy now or we're not. But I'm asking our audience to think of health in a process terms as a resource that we have, a resource that we ha- use in order to cope with life, to keep our energy level up, to find meaning in life, and so on. So once you think of health as a resource, then it makes sense to think, how can we improve it? Mm. How can we enrich that resource that I'm calling health? So the whole thing doesn't make sense unless we got that idea. I'm talking about health as a resource so you can get in better shape so you got more energy to do your job. And live more fully and better relationships. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. You know, you started uh, the lecture uh, talking about uh, Carol, yeah. a BGSU student right. and a person that you remain in contact with over the years. Yeah, Carol, a student of mine at Bowling Green State University, shortly after that, she was diagnosed with mercury poisoning, and her life was nothing but suffering from then on. All kinds of illnesses, heart problems, everything you could think of, a lot of pain, and so on. And I, I, I use the story in order to highlight the difference between what I called curing and healing. Hmm. So I said a lot of prayers for Carol. She was anointed, the Catholic ceremony, anointing of the sick, one of the seven sacraments. And uh, she was never healed. She was never healed of her diseases, the mercury poisoning and so on. However, she was given strength to find meaning in the midst of that. She wasn't cured, she was healed. She had a deep faith in Christ. She called Christ her best friend. She prayed to Christ, was open to Christ, talked to him, counted on him, told him how angry she was. She could say anything she wanted to Jesus because he was her best friend. And I say in that she found meaning. Mm. That is, uh, she had healing. She didn't have curing, she had healing. I and mean, it, it energized her to do all kind of charitable work while she was sick, collecting toys for kids and uh, getting Easter baskets, Christmas things to kids and so on. Cardi's, uh, her nickname was Cardi, Cardi's Charities. So here's a woman who had nothing but trouble in terms of uh, bad diseases and so on, but who found meaning in life, who found health in life by her living the, her Christian faith, following Jesus, and trying to be, live a charitable life. Jesus as my best friend, is that a common way to frame? That, that's a really personal way of... Yeah, it's very, yeah. There's people who've had very intimate talk about Jesus like that. A lot of the saints talked about like a spiritual marriage with Jesus. And so there's a lot of graphic imagery and so on. I don't know too many people who talk about Jesus as their best friend, but it's it's a powerful image and might be helpful to some people to think of that. For sure. So we have uh, several components of health and you also kind of framed it that it's a holistic view that yeah. all these pieces tie together. And, right. and uh, But we started yeah. with spirituality. Yeah, and so we're trying to have health physically and mentally and socially and spiritually. And integrated, be a fully integrated human. Yeah, so yeah. that's the common term these days, integrated approaches to health, right. holistic health. Right. And since you are a theologian, why don't we start with spirituality? That's uh, the right place to start, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, 
Thomas Merton, one of your yeah. one of your mentors and people you you looked up Trappist to. Monk Trappist Monk died in 1968 to look at him. Seven Story Mountain is his autobiography. Mm. And he, you raised uh, the this aspect of spirituality and healthy spirituality, the public self versus the private self. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, that part of the lecture was pretty dense, I thought. <laughs> um, l- l- let's put it this way. We need to grow in our spiritual health, okay? There, I see two general ways that we would try to do that. One is by increasing our inner self, getting closer to who we are, finding God within, Hmm. tapping the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, dealing with Christ, however you see him, as your liberator, as your friend, as your savior, you know, and getting closer. It's going within. So, in other words, part of the way we're gonna grow spiritually is to get away from chronic busyness from always this frenzied activity. We have to put down our phone, probably. Got to put the phone down. Yeah. Got to get some yeah. quiet time. Get away from ordinary routines. Get away from the television, and go within. Now that's really hard. I mean, um, to get how, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. I mean? One author, Richard Rohr, thinks if you just spend time in quiet prayer. Yeah, good things will happen. You'll mm-hmm. get in touch with the Spirit eventually. Right. One of the things in that going within is in, in prayer, we want to say fewer words. In other words, the spiritual masters say too, too much talking is going to get in the way. You don't want to talk too much in prayer to God. What you want to do is listen more and see if, you, if the Spirit is speaking to you from within. Pope Francis talks about it as discerning what the Spirit wants us to do. And I, I think, but again, it's hard to say how you do that. I, put the phone away, sit and be quiet, and try to listen to God. You could try it by listening to God, as St. Ignatius advised in the spiritual exercises, by placing yourself in a biblical scene and mm-hmm. seeing if Jesus speaks to you or not. So you're in the boat, storm comes up, everyone's upset, Jesus is asleep. Um, you're there, the water's coming out, you're afraid you're gonna die, get drowned and so on. And you put yourself in that scene and then you say, is Jesus saying anything to me? What he said to the disciples was, you people of little faith, <laughs> you know, you people of little faith, you know, why were you so worried? I'll take care of you. So, Brad, this is a hard idea, but you have to go within. You've got to be quiet to grow spiritually, become more spiritually healthy. You've got to have introspection. Thomas Merton did. You picked up Merton, okay. He said you have to go from the false self. The false self is the self that you protect, project to the world, that you want people to see, that you... That's the public uh, the self. The persona that you want to... Yeah, the yeah. public, yeah. yeah. And to go and to find the true self. And if we get to the true self, we'll figure, well, I'm not the, the person who made great strides on the basketball court, you know, or I'm not the woman with God blessed with great good looks. You know, those are true things, but I'm made in the image of God. I'm a child of God. I'm worthwhile because God loves me. God, what the, the deepest thing that lives in it is the Holy Spirit. So Merton thought by this process that we could um, find our true self. And the true self is great. True self is, I'm, I'm worthwhile. I got dignity. You know, God calls me by name. Jesus loves me. The Holy Spirit uh, energizes me. So. That's what Merton would mean by the true self. Now, do people do that? I mean, I know people who meditate and know what I'm saying. Right. There's people who actually have done what I'm talking about here, have gone within enough to find God, and they feel better about themselves. They might be a person who failed in their graduate studies, but they still know they're loved by God. That's how we overcome the problems. Right. Brad, I, I need to get a second thing. We're going to grow spiritually also 
by tapping our religious traditions. Hmm. We've got a whole bunch of people today, over 20% of Americans, who say, I'm spiritual but not religious. It's very common. All the surveys are showing I'm spiritual but not religious. And what I would like to say is that our religious traditions, and I'm speaking about Christianity, can help us to grow spiritually. So religion isn't something that just people made up. It's rooted in experience, rooted in real life experiences. So the disciples following Jesus were totally upset, frustrated, depressed because he was killed. They thought he was the Messiah, going to save them. And then what happens, they experience him as alive. We call it the resurrection. And that was life-changing for them. But that's what the religion grows out of. It doesn't fall down from the sky. It grows out of real-life experiences of the disciples of Jesus and of all the future followers of Jesus who feel his power and presence. So I would like to say the Christian faith, going to church regularly, attending Mass, celebrating the sacraments, getting your kids baptized, um, listening to the social teaching of the church, all of that can help you, help you grow spiritually. So we're going to become healthier by going within, and we're going to become healthier by taking seriously our religious tradition. You mentioned uh, St. Ignatius. There was a part in your lecture you talked about contemplatives and action. Yeah, that's one of the Jesuit phrases. Yeah, In life, you want to be a contemplative in action. So you're active in the world, but as you're doing that, you're working out of your inner core. You're working out of your faith perspective. You're guided by the Spirit. You're doing your job. You know, you're a plumber. You're doing a good job. You work hard. Put the bread on the table for the people. You love your family and so on. But in doing that, you can well be in touch with, this has got a deeper meaning or I get my energy from my faith, or the reason I do a good job is because I think Christ calls me to do a good job. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm faithful to my job. I'm a good union member because, you know, my faith tells me organizations are important. So, yeah, I think it works together. And piggybacking on another person, John Shea, says you have to go find yourself. It's an interesting action. You gotta go find yourself. Yeah. And that's the internal piece you just talked yeah, John about. John Say had this idea that we got two eyes. Our soul has two eyes. The one eye looks within. All the stuff I'm talking about looks to the spirit within. Mm-hmm. My second eye looks outward, like how can I live my faith in the world? Wow. So we're growing spiritually healthier. So that seems a good starting point. And we have another one. We have the physical health. And you you framed it that there, we have an obligation to take care of our body, yeah. which has implications t- for a lot of just practical things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot. most of that stuff I drew from think, places like the Mayo Clinic right. or yeah. the Cleveland Clinic mm-hmm. or Psychological Association and so on who tell us about attending to our physical health. And there's certain, when you read the literature, certain things keep emerging. Exercise regularly. Watch your diet. You know, get proper sleep, seven to eight hours a night. Set aside time for yourself. All kind of good stuff that is available generally in in the public realm. One of those things that, that I think I stressed was the problem of, of old being, people being overweight. Mm. I think I used the thing, one-third are obese and one-third are overweight. We've got two-thirds of the population with the problem. And so <clears throat> a lot of the literature is like, well, how are you going to deal with that, you know? But the psychologists say, don't go on a diet. <laughs> You're not on a diet, you know, because you'll fall, you'll get off the diet before long, right. you know. So what they want you to do is uh, is exercise regularly and eat proper food, get a balanced diet. I always think that sometimes I suggest that people, Catholics, do their Lenten penance is uh, not to give up alcohol or maybe to give up desserts, but to figure out during Lent how I could develop healthier eating habits so that when Easter comes, I'm in shape for, I'm, now I'm ready. I got a healthy eating habit. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I mean, they got all kind of good ideas. If you eat while you watch television, well, don't do that. <laughs> no, eat when you're not watching television. Right. So, you know, a lot of, yeah. I, I'm going to take you back to the 80s, 1980s. I recall that you were a runner, that you would go out and jog like at 4 o'clock every day. You're pretty regular yeah. with that. So yeah. now as... Over the decades, how's that? How's the exercise regimen changed for you? Uh, I've been, uh, it's been important to me my whole life. Yeah. Of course, I love sports, so that was all of that. As one gets older, one has to be more programmatic about it. I mean, I can tell you what I do. I do stretching exercises every day, just in my apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, I do agility exercises, so I'm less likely to fall over. Um, I do weights. I go to the gym about three or four times a week. I do the machines. I do four different machines um, to try to, and I'm very careful about my diet. I don't eat between meals. I try to eat healthy foods and so on. And believe me, it gets harder as right. you get older. Yes, You have to work harder at it and be more mindful of it. But yeah, I, I, what I always respected when I was a full-time pastor and I would go out, I did it late afternoon, I often did my exercises. Yeah. And people knew that and they respected it. I, I, I never remember anybody saying, why are you spending all this time exercises? You should be out counseling me or something, you know. And I, people always respected that. And so that encouraged me to do it. I think you also, you were very uh, structured in your day. Your morning was writing, and you had segments yeah. of the day, but it was um, a discipline that you, I remember you saying once that, that in that discipline that include the reflection time and the exercise, yeah. it made me a more effective and productive yes. person. Yeah, and I always felt it gave you more was, freedom, actually. Yes, yeah. that's a good word, more freedom. When I was especially stressed, I found it was more important to exercise than any other, and to meditate. Mm -hmm. I remember going one on one with you uh, on the basketball court. I can't and remember what were, the outcome was. There were people public watching this uh, well, event. Yeah, I remember what it was, uh, how the outcome was, but I'm not going to say. Thank you. <laughs> I do remember also coaching uh, the Catholic priests against the Lutheran ministers in a fundraising <laughs> game. Your good friend Tim Smith was actually the head coach. He yeah. made me the assistant. Yeah. Um, but that was fun. But the physicality was has always been a, a important. Sports thing. have been so important in my life. Yeah. Got it from my father and loved it. Still watch. And uh, I have to tell you that that. In your lecture, you made the comment about the importance of taking care of your body, but not to idolize your body or turn it to it. And you use the, this is the, so I go to the gyms about every morning, <laughs> and there's mirrors all, so you said there's mirrors all over the place. And now <laughs> when I look in the mirror, I think of you, and I do look in the mirror, <laughs> so I have, a, I have a little bit of ways to go on that, finding the right balance. So thanks for... Yeah, I mean, we, idolization of the body, I mean, idolizing beautiful body, objectifying yeah. beautiful bodies, you know, yeah. general problem. And then on the other hand, abusing our body, that is uh, not taking care of it, not exercising, overeating, over drinking, drugs, and so on. So let's go to the mental health aspect, and there's the emotional component built into that. And, you know, COVID probably has impacted us in that area the most significantly. And I, just speaking generally, there's been a tendency to withdraw from relationships over the last couple of years, go inward. Yeah. And so now we're all trying to figure out how to help each other reconnect. And that's in our personal lives and also the work lives. Yeah. For sure. I'd like to actually save that idea for talking about our social health, yeah. if you don't mind. We can do that. Yeah. So we got to attend to our emotional health. I mean, one of the important things is to be able to name our emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, I might feel, it might help me to know if I'm frustrated or if I'm angry. I've noticed in my own life, if I can name it right, I'm angry because he did that you know, that I then can deal with it better. It dissipates. You get it accurate, though. Yeah. I'm not frustrated because you did. I'm angry. I'm angry at him. Yeah. 
So uh, naming the emotions is, seems to be a, a very helpful thing. Keep track of positive emotions. I'm elated because my team won the game. You know, I'm happy because uh, uh, my kids made progress in school or whatever. So uh, things and, were grateful. That, things were grateful for. Yeah. 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 Very good. Link that together. Yeah. Link that together. And then the the negative emotions, which are often embarrassing, often embarrassing. Right. I'm jealous. I remember a couple. The major problem was that the husband was jealous of his wife's success. Mm. She made more money than he did. She had more friends. Marriage broke up because he couldn't deal the, with his jealousy of his own wife. I mean, this is this happens. Yeah. Negative emotions. We have to be able to face them and find out how to deal with them. They're real. One of the things that um, I think, again, you bring in the Christian perspective is to realize what a rich emotional life Jesus had. I, I mean, he got uh, frustrated, he got angry, the, the money changers in the temple. He was deeply hurt and compassion towards a widow who lost her son. He was angry at the Pharisees who were hypocrites. He was uh, frustrated that his disciples couldn't seem to grasp his message. He felt abandonment. He says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Whole range of emotions that Jesus had, which is important to realize. You know, he got tired. He had what I'd call ministry distress. That is, he was tired dealing with the sick all the time and uh, yeah. people needed his help and so on. He had to get away. We got to go off by ourselves for a while, um, so I, I like to think of uh, like Carol would say, her best friend knew how upset she was with her illness. That's why she could talk to him. I'm angry, you know, and, and I think that that's can be helpful for Christians. Right. You know, I'm angry all the time. Well, so was Jesus angry in the temple. So what? Yeah. Right. And we talked also about, uh, in the lecture, this idea of trying to learn new things yeah. to keep our mental acuity yeah. strong. <laughs> yeah. Just for practicality, but also in some Alzheimer research, yeah. the importance of that as we get older is even greater. Yeah, yeah. See, I think that you're a good example of this, Brad, because you're preparing for these uh, podcasts and keeping your mind alive. I love it. For sure. Well, actually, when I started the podcast, I was 60 years old, my yeah. own, and now we're doing this. And so it is a, a new experience, a new skill set. And yeah. hopefully I can do it for a long time, and it keeps the it's synapses. It's a great way to ward off Alzheimer's, Brad. <laughs> okay. We need a, to, You and I need to keep talking then. There's a, a <laughs> couple that did a study of Notre Dame nuns trying to figure out how some of them kept mentally sharp and others didn't, got Alzheimer's or whatever you'd call it, dementia, various kinds. And, and uh, they found out the nuns who found new things, learned new things, were the ones who stayed healthy. So I, the interviewers were asked, what are you going to do? We're going to take up pottery. <laughs> it's new. The scientists, you know, they right. said what we learned from the nuns is we have to find new things for ourselves. Right. And f even for you, turning it back with the podcasting, you're using a new technology to connect with people in a different way and expand uh, insights from your theology. Brad, my use of technology is so limited that it doesn't help me at all, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Well, <laughs> we have WGT here, WGTE here to help. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. Um, and uh, let's go, and the managing stress part, obviously, is an important part of the, the mental health piece, yeah. and you also have just the disease aspect of mental health with depression and schizophrenia, and those are more challenging aspects, yeah. too, for sure. Yeah. So should we pivot to the social part? We're social creatures. <clears throat> I, why not? And the COVID impact, as we mentioned earlier, has been significant. What, I, what are some of the things that you've encouraged people to do to kind of come out of the COVID malaise? And yeah. We need our support systems. 
You know, we need to have uh, uh, people who are there for us that we can rely on. I'd start with family. Your family needs to be supportive of you. If you got a good family, healthy family, life, people love one another, listen to one another, it's a great gift. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. If it's not, we have to figure out how we can improve our relationships with our family. Maybe it means asking forgiveness from your sister who you wronged years ago. Right. You know, or telling your dad that you forgive him for being such a harsh, unemotional father, whatever. So I think we need to repair those relations as much as possible. So family is absolutely crucial. In our church setting, we say the family is the domestic church. Mm. That's a wonderful phrase. It comes from Pope John Paul II. The family is the domestic church. It's where we learn the faith. It's where we learn how to virtues, where we learn how to argue and forgive and make up. It's where we learn patience, forbearance of our family members who got weird habits and are so different from what, from what we are. So family, absolutely crucial in, in, in having it. And the other thing, of course, is friends. And that takes back the COVID thing, how often people weren't in touch with friends. Or some people found creative ways of being in touch with friends, right? By, what do they call that? Uh, Zoom? Zoom, yeah. Did you do that at all? A uh, great deal, yes. And then the business side, WebEx, same thing. It's, it's video conferencing. And yeah. we all got more comfortable with it. But the question is, is, is does it better than what we're doing right now, sitting yeah. across from each other talking. And I have to think probably not. Probably not, right. And so after COVID, we looked at how can we reestablish friendships? You know, how can we call up people we haven't seen? Or instead of Zoom, let's sit together for lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, or we're going to drive to your house in the other state and and we'll spend the night and we'll, we can talk things over. So we try to find ways. Friendship is about availability, I think. Mm. Friends are available. They're there when you need them. You know, and, and most people have a friend and say, I don't care what I was going through, she would be there for me. I know it, and if she needed me, I would be here for her. Mm. So availability is a key way of thinking about, about friendships, for sure. And that availability aspect can be um translated over to the office settings and work settings. Yeah. Obviously, the work from home was in in play for several years, and now people are used to that, and it's hard to hit the right balance now. It sure is. And there is the benefit of the in-person, but there's a lot of productivity pieces that people are saying, I'm more productive when I'm working from home. And look, all the time I save not commuting. For sure, especially on the East Coast and West Coast. Yeah. So... COVID has impacted a lot of different... I know a lot of enlightened corporations, I think, are talking about uh, letting people work at home, but periodically coming together at some central yeah. office, some central place, so that we could interact, exchange ideas, learn from one another. What know? about the... Just go to the mask aspect. Obviously, everyone... Um, online services, you know, there are live streams. Sometimes you can read the paper and watch a, a mass. I know. Or you can go there in person. Yeah. What's your thoughts? Hard question, isn't it? Because people have gotten used to it. Yeah. I think most parishes that I'm in touch with or know about say our mass attendance is down and that with the COVID not feeling so restrictive, not feeling restrictive, uh, some people are coming back, but not as many. Mm -hmm. Our attendance is not as much. I think there's a big loss in that. I mean, liturgy is about communal worship. We go to Mass to do something together, right. you know, to offer praise and worship to God through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit. We're there to share the greeting of peace, to listen to the scriptures together, to go to communion, you know, to receive the body and blood of Christ, our nourishment for the journey. Yeah, you got to figure out how it's back to that question of uh, of religion being helpful. 
you know, religion can help us to grow in various ways. So you bring that's a great point you bring up, Brad, and I don't know where it's going to go. The Catholic bishops have been worried about it and tried to write something about nourishing us with the Eucharist. I think the better liturgies that parishes have, the more likely they are to get people back. Yeah. The better the music the more is. More people that want to come. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. If the music's good, if the homily's good, if the acoustics are good, yeah. they can hear the word and so on. I always tell priests in remodeling churches, you know, put a high priority on acoustics. Right. So people can actually hear when they're there. A welcoming environment, right? Oh, the environment, yes. the yes. ushers and yes. so on, yeah, to make people feel yeah. welcome, yeah. Well, you um, have really kind of given us this whole idea of an integrated health, but all four of those pillars are, are really, really important. So thank you for sharing those thoughts and good health to you. Thanks, go Brad. Forward. Same to you. Thanks, J.B. Mm-hmm.